A chilly November morning in 1983 at Heathrow Airport, London. Six armed men break into the seemingly impenetrable Brinks Mat security depot. Little did they know, they were about to uncover a treasure trove. A mind-blowing 26 million pounds in gold bullion, diamonds, and cash. This wasn't just any heist. It was a seismic event that shook the foundations of the British criminal underworld, marking it as one of the most significant heists in history. In this thrilling episode, we're not just recounting a heist. We're unraveling a story of intrigue, daring, mystery, and a cursed treasure. We delve deep into the heart of the Brinks Mat robbery, exploring how the robbers executed their plan, the curse that followed, and the biggest mystery, the fate of the looted gold. Was there an insider? What is the true cost of ill-gotten wealth? So stay tuned and make sure to watch it until the end. The 1980s marked a period of significant transformation in London, with established industries, street scenes, and ways of life giving way to change. Amidst the often divisive politics of the time, the city saw the rise of towering banks and ambitious skyline structures, symbolizing its aspirations and progress. However, this era of transition was about to face a huge setback with the notorious Brinks Mat heist. The calm nights of the city were abruptly shaken when news of this audacious robbery spread. It wasn't merely an attack on a major estate. It wounded the community's sense of security and is widely regarded as a pivotal moment in British crime. The Brinks Mat Warehouse, located in Unit 7 of the Heathrow Estate, became the focal point of the crime. This unit featured a large warehouse space, parking lot, and first floor offices. Having a grasp of this background is essential as we dig into the specifics of the heist itself. On the cold morning of November 26, 1983, around 6.30 am, five security guards stood outside a high-security warehouse near Heathrow Airport, eagerly awaiting the opening of the automatic security shutters. These guards were employees of Brinks Mat, a company specializing in the global transportation of valuable goods. Unit 7, the focal point of the warehouse, housed a reinforced concrete vault equipped with 11 locks and 5 alarms. At the time, the Brinks Mat Vault was considered one of the most secure facilities globally. Approximately 10 minutes later, at 6.40am, a South London gang led by Brian Robinson and Mickey McAvoy broke into the warehouse, anticipating a £3 million cash vault. The cash was anticipated because of Anthony Black, a Brinks Matt security guard living with Robinson's sister. He provided inside help by revealing the location of the cash. The robbers acquired weapons like submachine guns, shotguns, and other firearms, along with walkie-talkies and a Ford Transit van, from the black market to carry out the heist. They also made use of fake identification documents and rented a nearby warehouse to stash the stolen goods. With Black facilitating their entry, the robbers overpowered the security guards, tied them up, and threatened them with patrol. Black identified the senior guards with access to the vault, where three safes were located. However, their original plan to seize three million pounds went awry when a nervous guard couldn't recall this part of the code. Frustrated, the robbers started exploring the vault and stumbled upon an unexpected windfall, more than three tons of gold bullion. They were packed into over 70 cardboard boxes, almost all containing 7,000 gold bars, which were the property of Johnson Matthew Bankers Lud. The gang's initial expectations of a three million pounds cash haul transformed into a staggering 26 million pounds worth of gold, along with 100,000 pounds worth of cut and uncut diamonds intended for the Far East. Upon opening the safe, the reality of transporting multiple tons of gold became apparent. What was initially planned as a quick smash and grab evolved into a protracted operation as gang members sought more robust transportation for the substantial loot. The robbers employed the warehouse's forklift to load the gold into a van, spending nearly two hours clearing the safe. By 8.15 am, they had left the warehouse, and at 8.30 am a guard had raised the alarm. As they left Heathrow in the van, one of the robbers ironically wished the security guards a Merry Christmas. 
Approximately 15 minutes after the robbers fled, one of the staff members managed to free himself from handcuffs and promptly alerted the police about the incident. Scotland Yard Flying Squad Chief Commander Frank Cater took charge of the investigation to apprehend the thieves. Two days after the heist, a couple in Bath, Somerset, noticed a hot crucible smoldering on their neighbor's property. Concerned that it might be connected to the bullion robbery, they promptly contacted the police. Upon arrival, the police acknowledged the information but deemed it beyond their jurisdiction. They assured the couple that they would pass on the details. Surprisingly, the couple was never asked to provide a statement or give evidence in court. The police's failure to immediately follow up on this tip-off remained unexplained. This failure would prove to be a big miss for the police in the investigation, as the consequences would be discussed later on. Due to the audacity and high level of skill involved in the operation, the police swiftly narrowed down the list of potential suspects to Mickey McAvoy and Brian Robinson. The duo hadn't been discreet about recruiting participants for a rumored inside job they were planning. Nicknamed the Colonel, Robinson was already known to the police, while McAvoy was recognized as one of South London's most prolific armed robbers. Recognizing that the gang had inside information, the police honed in on Anthony Black, who arrived late to work on the day of the heist, missing the entire event. The police were slowly but surely moving in the right direction. After obtaining the stolen valuables, the robbers faced a challenge in selling the gold bars. They turned to crime boss Kenneth Noy for assistance. Noy's contact, John Palmer, a former director of the gold and jewelry dealing company Scadlinblood, near Bristol, played a crucial role. Noy and Palmer devised a sophisticated plan to convert the highly pure gold into cash. Since selling it in its original form would raise suspicion due to its purity of 99.99%, he took strategic steps. Noy enlisted an accomplice in Hatton Garden to remove the gold bar's serial numbers. These bars were then discreetly sent, a few at a time, to John Palmer, who had a smelter in his home near Bath. Palmer melted down the gold, blending it with lower quality gold, silver, and base metal. The mixture was then sent for sale on legitimate exchanges. To safeguard against inquiries about the bullion's origin, Noy flew to Jersey, legitimately purchasing 11 gold bars and obtaining the necessary paperwork. Palmer's company, Scadlin, sold the processed gold on the exchanges. Payments were lodged at a small Barclays branch in the Bristol suburb of Bedminster. Boldly, Palmer claimed VAT refunds on the gold, despite no VAT being paid, granting him a 15% bonus. The processed gold was then sent to the Sheffield Assay Office for official approval and authorization. This step looked unrelated to the robbery and helped avoid suspicion. The gold was subsequently sold on the black market, making its traceability nearly impossible. Approximately 13 million pounds worth of gold was disposed of using this method. However, the movement of such a substantial sum of money through a local bank drew the attention of the Bank of England. Surveillance operations targeting known criminals commenced, especially after three million pounds were withdrawn from a single Bristol bank branch. The police, on the other hand, started connecting the dots. Nicknamed the Colonel, Robinson was already known to the police, while McAvoy was recognized as one of South London's most prolific armed robbers. Recognizing that the gang had inside information, the police honed in on Anthony Black, who arrived late to work on the day of the heist, missing the entire event. The connection to Robinson's sister led to a quick confession by Black. He revealed the names of the newly wealthy McAvoy and Robinson. Both McAvoy and Robinson drew attention to themselves by swiftly moving from modest South London council houses to a lavish estate in Kent, all paid for in cash. There were also rumors circulating that McAvoy had purchased two Rottweiler dogs to guard his mansion, humorously named Brinks and Matt, displaying a lack of remorse or understanding. After Black revealed the names, the first arrest was for Robinson. Scotland Yard uncovered the detailed family connection, and Black confessed to aiding and abetting the team. 
He told them everything about how he provided them with a key to the main door and details of security measures. Robinson was arrested in December of 1983. The next arrest was that of Mickey McAvoy. Following this, the Bank of England took notice of the substantial movement of funds through a Bristol bank, triggering alerts from authorities. Kenneth Noy also came under police surveillance as a result. After the arrests of all the suspects, the trial commenced, triggering a series of staggering events. In 1985, undercover police officer DC John Fordham was stabbed 10 times by Kenneth Noy after Noy discovered him hiding on his large Kent estate while he was under police surveillance. While Noy was arrested for murder, he convinced the jury it was self-defense and was acquitted by a majority decision. However, in a subsequent search, police found 11 gold bars worth 100,000 pounds on Noy's premises. In 1986, Noy was found guilty of handling the Brinks mad gold and received a 14-year prison sentence. Despite this, Noy served only seven years before being released in 1994. Two years later, he committed murder in a road rage-fueled attack on the M25, resulting in his extradition from Spain, a conviction for Stephen Cameron's murder, and a life sentence in 2000. Robinson, who got arrested in December 1983 after being exposed by Stephen Black, received a 25-year prison sentence, while Stephen Black, who admitted to assisting the robbers by letting them into the building, was sentenced to six years behind bars. McAvoy faced the same jail term as Robinson for armed robbery after the heist. However, in an attempt to strike a deal with prosecutors by returning his share from the robbery, McAvoy found that the money had already disappeared. In 1995, McAvoy was held accountable for the money stolen in the Brinks Matt heist by the High Court, which ordered him to pay 27 million pounds. The smoldering hot crucible incident, initially reported by a vigilant couple two days after the heist, but ignored by the police, unfolded into a significant development over a year later. Authorities eventually conducted a raid on the residence where the smelter was located. Subsequently, John Palmer was arrested. However, he successfully argued in court that he was unaware the gold he handled belonged to Brinksmat. Consequently, he was cleared of all charges related to the heist. In 2001, Palmer faced a different legal battle. He was convicted of fraud tied to a timeshare scheme and sentenced to eight years in prison. He allegedly defrauded 20,000 people of an astonishing 30 million pounds. Despite an estimated fortune of 300 million pounds at the time of his conviction, Palmer, who served only half of his prison term, declared bankruptcy in 2005 with debts totaling 3.5 million pounds. In 2007, he faced fraud charges in Spain, spending two years in custody before being released on bail. Perry, who was involved in disposing of the stolen gold bullion, was convicted at the Old Bailey in 1992 for handling stolen property. He received a nine-year sentence. George Francis, another individual linked to the raid, also faced subsequent repercussions. Now, one of the most intriguing aspects of the Brinks Matt robbery lies in the identity of the robbers. While these six men were eventually arrested and convicted, it is widely believed that they were just a small part of a more extensive criminal network. Retrieving money was a problem as well. Despite attempts by the police to trace the money, the investigation faced obstacles due to a lack of witness cooperation and physical evidence. However, as the probe unfolded, connections to organized crime and corrupt police officers emerged, resulting in several high-profile convictions. In September 1985, a specialized team took charge of the case, focusing on Patrick Diamond. A raid on his financial service operations office revealed that he was laundering criminal cash through offshore companies. Although investigators couldn't immediately tie this money to the Brinks Matt robbery, Diamond's leads prompted officers to explore the British Virgin Islands, especially one accountant. This accountant was found to be orchestrating an extensive money laundering operation, handling hundreds of millions for various crime syndicates, a scale unprecedented for the police. 
While they couldn't directly link this operation to the Brinks Matt robbery, suspicions lingered, adding another layer of complexity to the case. One of the most significant missions following the Brinks Matt robbery was the retrieval of the stolen gold, diamonds, and money. However, every aspect looked like a maze with plenty of loopholes that needed to be debunked. In 1983, when the thieves managed to pilfer an astonishing three tons of gold, a record two million pounds reward was set for those who would locate the gold. However, nothing much was discovered. A mere one million pounds worth was discovered stored at the Bank of England, while the rest of the loot was rumored to have been buried. Fast forward to 1996, when about half of it, the portion that had been melted and recast, was suspected to have infiltrated the legitimate gold market. Some even claim that anyone in the UK wearing gold jewelry post-1983 could be unwittingly adorned with Brinks matte gold. Money laundering was an issue as well. Gordon Perry played a key role in laundering a significant amount of money from the Brinks matte robbery. As revealed in the Panama Papers, an offshore financial firm in Jersey called Center Services sought the assistance of Mossack Fonseca to establish a Panamanian company named Fiberian about a year after the Heathrow raid. Acting under Perry's direction, millions of pounds were funneled through Fiberian and other front companies, utilizing banks in Switzerland, Liechtenstein, Jersey, and the Isle of Man. To conceal the transactions, two nominee directors were appointed to Fiberian, and the company issued two bearer shares. Perry strategically utilized these offshore entities, channeling funds estimated at £10.7 million through various investments, including land in London Docklands, buildings previously part of Cheltenham Ladies College, a farmhouse for Mickey McAvoy's girlfriend, and a sizable residence for Perry and his family. The Metropolitan Police, collaborating with Jersey authorities, conducted a raid on Center Services offices in late 1986. During the raid, papers and the two bearer shares of Fiberian were seized, unraveling the intricate web of money laundering associated with the Brinks Matt robbery. One peculiar incident that occurred less than a month after the Brinks Matt robbery was when Austrian police arrested five men at a Vienna hotel. During the arrest, they discovered 10 bullion bars marked with the refiner's insignia and serial numbers matching those stolen in the heist. However, the police soon realized that the bars were not authentic gold, but rather gold-coated tungsten counterfeits. This revelation prompted confusion as to why the counterfeiters would possess unpublished bar serial numbers from the actual robbery. The arrested men were suspected of planning to falsely claim that the fake bars were part of the Heathrow robbery. Yet no explanation was provided regarding how the counterfeiters acquired the unpublished serial numbers or what benefit they sought by counterfeiting stolen property in this manner. Turning to the legal aftermath, by 1995, the authorities had taken stringent measures. The assets of 57 individuals, including homes and even a Kansas oil well, were frozen. Insurers managed to recover 16 million pounds, including 3 million pounds from one of the culprits, Kenneth Moy. In January 1995, the High Court issued a hefty order against McAvoy, compelling him to make a payment of 27 million pounds and holding him accountable for the entire stolen sum. Brian, although acquitted of robbery, faced a similar High Court order in 1995. The court mandated him to repay the stolen 26 million pounds plus 2.2 million pounds in compensation, with his wife directed to repay 1.1 million pounds. The judge expressed satisfaction in concluding that Brian was involved in planning the robbery. By 2004, a cumulative total of 25 million pounds had been successfully recovered, marking the end of a convoluted journey for the stolen gold and its financial aftermath. As the ill-gotten gains of the audacious robbery circulated through the criminal underworld, a bizarre trail of death and mayhem followed, giving this case the name The Curse of the Brinks Matt Gold. One of the central figures in this macabre drama was Kenneth Noy, a man enlisted to recruit individuals capable of melting down the stolen gold. As mentioned earlier, in 1985, the police, led by Detective Constable John Fordham, closed in on Noy, 
A confrontation unfolded on Noy's property, resulting in a fatal scuffle. Fordham, who was stabbed ten times, succumbed to his injuries. Despite the brutal encounter, Noy managed to evade a murder conviction, claiming self-defense. However, justice eventually caught up with him when he received a 14-year sentence for conspiring to handle the pilfered gold. Released from prison, Noy's dark saga continued in 1996, when he received a life sentence for the murder of 21-year-old motorist Stephen Cameron in a road rage incident near the M25. The tentacles of the curse extended further with the murder of John Palmer, another key player in the brinks Matt saga, in 2015. Palmer's death remains unsolved, shrouding the case in further mystery. Tragic events also shaped the investigative environment surrounding the Brinks Matt heist. Private investigator Daniel Morgan also met a brutal end in 1987 when he was found murdered in his car. Charlie Wilson, a participant in the infamous Great Train robbery, became another casualty in 1990 when he was gunned down in his Marbella home after a significant sum of Brinks Matt money went missing. The list of victims grew, each one that was tied to the stolen gold. Nick Whiting, a known associate of Noy, was stabbed and shot in 1990. His lifeless body was dumped in Essex. Keith Headley, suspected of involvement, fell victim to gunfire in 1996. Jeweler Sally Nahum, who had handled some of the gold, met a grim fate in 1998 when he was shot dead outside his Hatton Garden residence. George Francis, a suspected Brink gang member, was shot dead in 2003. The eerie pattern persisted as Brian Perry, linked to the Brink's Matt raid, suffered a similar fate, shot dead as he arrived for work, not far from where Francis had been killed. So in a sense, the story of the Brinks Matt Gold heist is wrapped in a puzzling web of death. Many cases remain unsolved, and some are muddled with murder and killing. The Brinks Matt robbery left a lasting mark on the criminal world, exposing serious flaws in Heathrow Airport security and triggering a global revaluation of airport safety measures. Beyond the headlines, the incident unraveled connections between large scale organized crime, corrupt police, and money launderers, some of which law enforcement hadn't previously been aware of. This heist fundamentally shifted the perception and understanding of financial and organized crime in the UK, leading to significant reforms within the police force and a determined crackdown on organized criminal activities. Additionally, the Brinks Matt robbery shed light on how criminals were hiding their ill-gotten gains. The timing of the heist coincided with the boom in London's property market, particularly in the Docklands area. It's believed that the proceeds from the stolen gold played a role in financing this boom, marking the first instance where professional criminals had gathered enough capital to invest in legitimate sectors. Moreover, the aftermath of the robbery is thought to have fueled the cocaine market in Britain. Overall, the repercussions of the Brinks Matt robbery extended far beyond the initial crime scene. It prompted a revaluation of security practices, exposed previously unknown criminal connections, triggered reforms within law enforcement, and even played a role in shaping the trajectory of legitimate economic activities, like property investment, while inadvertently contributing to the expansion of illicit drug markets. Just about a year after the Brinks Matt robbery, on September 30, 1984, Johnson Matthew Bankers Lutt, the banking and gold trading division of Johnson Matthew, faced a major crisis. It collapsed, and the Bank of England had to step in to take control. This move was aimed at safeguarding the credibility of the London gold markets. The losses incurred by the bank were staggering, totaling over $300 million. The collapse was attributed to the bank's substantial loans to fraudsters and financially troubled businesses over several years. What made matters worse was the discovery of significant and unexplained gaps in the bank's records. The situation was so serious that the fraud squad was brought in to investigate not only the bank itself, but also certain customers who were connected to the questionable transactions. The heist impacted British society in unprecedented ways, especially at the crime scene. The sheer scale and boldness of the robbery raised concerns among the public about organized crime, 
In response, banks and other institutions beefed up their security measures, and the police intensified their efforts to tackle organized criminal activities. This heist is etched in British criminal history as a pivotal event with a lasting legacy. Its influence is still felt today. The audacity of the Brinks Matt heist has inspired a multitude of books, films, and television shows. One such example is the TV series The Gold, written by Neil Forsyth and produced by Tenatus Pictures. If you have bought gold jewelry in Britain since 1984, it is likely to contain traces of the Brinks Matt Gold. This line itself describes the monstrosity of this heist and the lasting impact that it holds. If you look at the whole tale of this heist, you'll be given a cautionary reminder about the fragility of the idea of honor among thieves, particularly when the loot is valued at 26 million pounds. You'll also witness a lack of foresight on both sides. Some of the criminals acted recklessly, spending money without much thought. On the flip side, the police struggled to apprehend most of those connected to the heist and the subsequent distribution. The story, therefore, underscores the complexities and shortcomings on both the criminal and law enforcement sides of this high-stakes crime. Even today, there are still a lot of whispers regarding the fact that a significant portion of the loot got buried cleverly somewhere in southern England. The idea was to keep the gold's allure a secret and protect it from greed and violence. This has compelled a new generation of British gangsters to be locked in a fierce battle, searching for what they believe remains hidden in the lockups of South London and the fields of Kent. Many still fear that the violent repercussions are far from over, with arguments and revenge still fueling the aftermath of this notorious heist. The saga serves as a grim reminder of the lasting impact of a single criminal event on individuals and society as a whole. Don't forget to subscribe for more in-depth stories that will leave you wondering, is that really happening? See you in the next one.